Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of the ABT Time podcast, which uh, means that it must be three o'clock here in California. And at the same time, it is 8 a.m. in Melbourne, Australia, home of my co-host, the wonderful and talented Miss um, <laughs> Jen Martin. <laughs> <laughs> you got yourself stuck then, didn't you, Randy? Because yeah. you thought, now I've been really offensive because I know she's actually a doctor, but I'm stuck now. So <laughs> what can you do, Randy? Just keep on digging, my friend. Yeah, I, it's dangerous when I start making stuff up off the top of my head. <laughs> there Good we go. morning, Randy. Lovely Good. to see you. Happy to see you. Um, how are you. Have you got your morning tea there? Always. Always, always for you, Randy. Always. Excellent. What time is it down there? Yeah, so it's eight o'clock on uh, in the morning, and I just managed to uh, find a particular photo that I wanted to use for my background today. You'll soon see why that was my particular choice, and I'm excited. Uh-huh. We get to talk ABT again this morning. Big time, and same thing for me, which was I pulled up this photo, uh, which is from my surf photographer buddy, Brian Bielman, who is legendary. By the way, this morning, I had one of the greatest surf sessions my entire life. <gasps> what happened? I was out there, and one of my buddies paddle over to a bunch of dudes and ask them, you guys ever heard the movie White Rhino? And they go, of course, it's our favorite surf movie. And he said, well, one of the producers over there and pointed to me. And these guys started paddling over one at a time. He said, dude, you're one of the producers, White Rhino. And yeah, it came out last year, <laughs> um, just one of four. But great movie. Why? Because I brought to the movie only the ABT framework. I worked with the young filmmaker, Brent Storm, who could have put together a good movie on his own. But with the ABT, helped him realize how to shape the stories. And that's what every one of these guys came over and said, oh, God, I just love the stories in that film. So wow. there you go. Our first big endorsement of the ABT framework for today's session, which will be wallowing deeply in the ABT, which, in fact, is um, gets us going on what we've got to work on here today. So we have a primary guest, which is Dr. Peter Sale, and he has just published a book titled Coral Reefs. Uh, my camera here from <laughs> Yale University Press. That's what we're here to talk about. And I have known him for a long time. And also joining us will be our supporting guest, Dr. Bob Stenick from University of Maine, who's also a coral reef ecologist. The three of us have been buddies for decades. And we'll try not to get too deep into the nostalgia dimension of all this sort of stuff. But we've all got a close connection for coral reefs. Um, at the core of this, as we know, this podcast is the ABT framework, and it's part of our narrative gym concept. So everybody listening to this, if you're in the course and you're working on narrative dimensions, this, this podcast will always be exploring elements of the ABT to help you strengthen your narrative intuition. So towards that end, let me begin by setting, setting up today's episode in terms of ABT dynamics. And one of the things I've been asked over the ages um, is... What's um? What what do you think is the best show on TV for science storytelling? And mm-hmm. I usually say I don't know that there's any that are that good. I'm not a big fan of a lot of these networks and yada yada yada. But my answer is always well. My favorite nonfiction show on TV, pretty much, is HBO Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. They just are tremendous storytellers there over the years. And I say if they ever did one in science, it would be the best science storytelling you'd see on TV. That happened in 2017. They did a segment about the Great Barrier Reef, and it was tremendous. So it had at its core a very simple ABT, which is Australia has this amazing tourism resource, the Great Barrier Reef, and it's their number one resource for tourism. But they're also major coal miners that are destroying the climate and killing the very reef that they love so much. Therefore, how do you reconcile these two things? That was the overall ABT that worked very, very well in the segment. Um, I watched it. I loved it so much that I transcribed the voiceover, the whole thing, and then did a blog post where I broke down the narrative structure of what they'd done in these 12 minutes. And lo and behold, it embodied everything that I preach in all the books on narrative structure. You could see the three-act structure. You could see use of superlatives on and on, all these specifics. Um, posted it and into the void. Two weeks later, I don't know where I get this email from Chapman Downs, the producer of the segment. Turns out he was on vacation with his wife, sitting by the pool in the Bahamas. Some one of her friends forwarded her my blog, my blog post, and she read it to him aloud. And of course, the whole thing was just raving about his work. And as he said to me, you know, nobody's ever analyzed my work. I'm just the producer. I'm behind the scenes guy. 
but it was so great that they ordered a bottle of champagne and automatically and celebrated that evening. And make a long story short, he and our best buddies these days, I had him come to the ABT course last fall and do a guest appearance there and talked about these sorts of things. But one of the hallmarks of that segment that just shows you the strength of the narrative structure is it's 12 minutes long and the first three minutes have no drama. The first three minutes are pure and, 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 and. It's pure context setup. It's why should we love this resource, coral reefs? And they take Bryant Gumbel going to diving around Green Island. They show these beautiful reefs. They talk about all the marvels of the reefs. It's just three minutes of just beauty. Like, wow, 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 wow. And then right on the button at three minutes, literally the word, but, but, Turns out what we're looking at here is an, is an anomaly nowadays. Most of the reef is in really bad shape. There's still a few little pockets like this, and they launch into the whole narrative there. That's pure ABT. Before you get to yelling at us about your problems and how upset you are about it, and we're going to do plenty of that in the segment because we are upset about coral reefs, but before you get there, the first thing you want to do is convey what's at stake. Why is this so important? Why should we be upset with you? And so towards that end, what we're going to do to begin this segment is the exact same thing. Nobody's allowed to get to the butt yet. We're going to all do <laughs> and, and, and for a little bit. And by the way, Jen, you're going to start this process, whether you like it or not. I didn't even warn you of this. No, but I have no idea what you want me to do. Here you go. I'll, yeah, I'll try. So we're going to tap into your improv training that you may or may not have um, <laughs> on your ability to, to be spontaneous. But what I want you to do is tell us your favorite story off the top of your head. You can think of your favorite moment on around a coral reef and i know you at least went to heron island um not that long yeah. ago right with the family and yeah. so think about that experience and when you if you claim that you are enthusiastic and passionate about coral reefs which i'm sure you must be what is that based on give us something that, that can help us relate to why you feel strongly about coral reefs um is there one little thing and and last but not least Ideally, it would be the story of the day, the hour, the minute, the moment. Is there a single moment where you looked at something and it had a big impact on you? Take it away, Jen. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I do have to give the background that, you know, I studied marine biology. So I had an intellectual understanding of coral reefs far before I ever saw one. I was fortunate enough also to go to Lizard Island. So I can tune in with you there, Randy. But the moment I want to describe is the moment that I got to share seeing turtles with my two young kids, because, you know, my kids have grown up with ecologists for parents. They've, they've heard nonstop how much we love nature. They've heard continuously how, how protective protecting nature is important but it's so different the moment that you're out there teaching little kids how to snorkel and you're just coasting you're in this beautiful to us Randy who live in southern Australia warm water at Heron <laughs> Island really quite All warm relative, water right? <laughs> at Heron Island and you know we'll you, Bob Stenick to comment on that the water temperature in the Great Barrier if you keep going yeah um and so we're just you know we're just getting our kids comfortable with with snorkels and masks and just kind of coasting out there and in fact we haven't even got to the coral yet that's the beauty of this and then all of a sudden you have this divine green sea turtle just coasting along beside you and it's that incredible moment of not only am I deeply emotional about seeing this beautiful animal and thinking about what I know about the Great Barrier Reef and the background to this holiday of why we've chosen to come because we want our kids to see healthy reef while they still can but then just looking over at my kids faces and thinking they're never going to forget this moment of seeing this beautiful animal and not feeling like they're outside this experience but they're inside this experience and they can watch this animal and be close enough to feel a connection to this animal without feeling like they're doing any damage or impacting this animal and just you know floating along and watching this green turtle go about uh, about her day his day I don't know um it was it was magic and I'll never forget seeing that through my kids eyes that, that's perfect and you know the the simple rule is don't tell us show us um and that's probably what was in the back of the, your kids minds you know enough about how great coral reefs are show us get us out yeah. there give us that one moment bingo you did it and then for the rest of the time you don't ever have to try and convince them how great these coral reefs are that's truly amazing um, so I will then share my little tidbit, which is from, you know, I started thinking this through lots, billions of stories, but one favorite moment for me was the summer of 1978. Um, I was 22 years old, spent that summer at, in Jamaica on the North shore of Jamaica, the discovery Bay Marine lab. 
and the coral reefs there in the North Shore of Jamaica that summer were in their prime. They were spectacular. They were some of the most beautiful coral reefs throughout the entire Caribbean. I went there to take a summer course in coral reef ecology taught by eight amazing instructors, one of whom was Dr. Bob Stenick, who will be joining us shortly. And all th that summer was, that lab was so vibrant that summer, there were probably 50 or so researchers with their assistants and staffs and graduate students and postdocs and undergraduates all there diving all day, every day. Just a whole fleet of boats and tons of scuba tanks and everybody spending all day out on the reef, all getting together at dinner that night in this big dining hall, sharing stories from the whole day. And as you showed up there, there was a whole culture to that lab because there's so much knowledge had been gathered there. And out on the reef, there were these different structures and things that, that people knew about. They were all labeled with names. There was um, pear tree bottoms, these gigantic sheet corals, plate corals that were like 10 feet in diameter. There were areas called the, um, the haystacks that were great formations of staghorn and elkhorn coral and all these kind of landmarks. And one of the terms that got tossed around a bunch was Oz. People talk about Oz, Oz. And I, I didn't know, you know, I kept hearing that name, not knowing what it was. And about the third day there, I was out doing one of the first dives. We were down pretty deep, like about 90 feet and coming up the reef slope and spectacular 200 foot visibility in this reef with all again these formations and we get up to probably about 40 feet where it kind of hit the reef crest and you come up over this little ridge and then i look off in the distance and there's this structure that is pillar coral basically one big colony of pillar coral that was huge that some of them probably eight to ten foot high these spikes that would go up and it was emerald green and from the distance it looked like the skyline of a city or something and i just glanced at it and i instantly thought god that looks like like the emerald city in the movie the wizard of oz <laughs> and then in the second moment i thought wait a second that's what everybody's talking about this we're at oz this is it oh my god and then you know all these fish swirling around and just the sun ray coming down 40 feet down the whole thing was just this vision in a spectacular moment the same sort of thing that just hits you and it's those moments that stay with you for eternity um, so on that note, let's add our guests one at a time. Bob Stenick, how about if you activate and later I'll tell your wonderful credentials, but join the party and share with us one of your moments of coral reefs. Sure, I'd really be happy to. Uh, I started working on coral reefs in 1972 and almost all of my work, I'm, I'm like six inches away from the seafloor. So I'm missing lots of stuff. But I have two things, uh, two different places uh, that stuck in my mind. And, and this is the splendor, pain, and bizarre aspects of coral reefs. Uh, the, the splendor is that after working all day, I uh, uh, went out with Bob Carpenter, who was working on sea urchins at the time. Uh, this is a long spine sea urchin that comes out at night. We got done with our work. It was pitch black out. And we turned off all of our lights. And as we were ascending, we could move our arms and the bioluminescence completely were outlining our bodies so that we could see each other perfectly. And it was a beautiful, beautiful night until I started feeling some stinging. And as it happens, I surfaced under a Portuguese man of war <laughs> and it literally was on my head. Um, I was covered with bites and stings. Um, that's the pain. Uh, if we shift over to, to Belize, because you don't give me much time here, uh, and that is, I, I was working on coral spawning. Now, a lot of people don't realize that coral, they just look like they sit there, but uh, there's certain types of coral that once a year, uh, and in the Caribbean, it's August, near a full moon, uh, they, they, uh, they reproduce, and they, they dispel all their eggs. And uh, so I, we were out there trying to capture these eggs so we could raise them, and you go out there, and and nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And all of a sudden, all of these corals, all these eggs were, 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 were being released. And honest to God, I'm from Maine. It looked like somebody's movie of a snowstorm being played backwards. <laughs> all, all the snowflakes are, are going up. And uh, it, it's just one of those things. I didn't have it on, on film, but um, it's captured in my mind. So you asked for one example, I gave you two. Well, they're both so excellent that you're allowed to have two of those. That, that was excellent. And I've seen the mass spawning on the Great Barrier Reef. Same thing. I never thought about it as a reverse snowstorm. That's awesome. That is exactly what it's like. <laughs> Wonderful. Well done. And on that note, then, we have set the stage for our special guest, Dr. Peters. Oh, no, stay with us, Bob. It's now group discussion time, and you are meant to be the Ed McMahon of the show, uh, <laughs> getting in your side comments and questions. So, Dr. Peter Sale, if you can join us there. Uh, you are the star of the show. As I said, we're here to talk about your book, Coral Reefs. 
before we give a whole bunch of background, how about share with us? Uh, and you and I had a long talk last weekend. And in the middle of it, I, I sort of asked you, why'd you write this book? And you said, because I hit this point in life where I realized, you know, aside from friends and family, this is the thing that I love most in life is coral reefs and the depth of your passion for them. So back that up with one good little story like that, if you could. You got something for us? Yeah, one good little story. And the problem is deciding which one to pick. And I was I was thinking about that. And uh, I thought about Steve's Balmy. And Steve's Balmy is a place that you can't find it on Google. In fact, if you Google it, you discover there's a Steve's Balmy, which is between Ribbon Reef 2 and 3 and the far north Great Barrier Reef. And that's not the one I'm talking about. The Steve's Balmy I'm talking about is just off the edge of the northern edge of One Tree Reef. And uh, when I first started working in one Tree Island, uh, which was 1971, something like that. Um, nobody knew where Steve's Balmy was because Steve had left. <laughs> Steve, had, Steve had been the, the um, caretaker at One Tree Island when it was first started in the early, in the late sixties. And he'd been taken off to Lizard Island when Lizard Island got started as a research station. And, uh, his knowledge left with him. And we knew there was a Steve's Balmy and it was apparently this beautiful mound of coral that rose from about 70 or 80 feet of water and came up close to the surface and it was offshore from the edge of the reef, but we didn't know where it was. And uh, anyway, um, some years after that, a couple of years after that, the then station manager by the name of Graham Russell rediscovered it. And maybe he got in touch with Steve and found out where it was, I don't know. But anyway, he rediscovered it. And so I was going on my first dive to uh, uh, Steve's Balmy. It was just a, a joy dive, a fun dive. We weren't doing any work there. And there were about six of us or so. And we went out and we anchored on top of it. It was a nice day. We anchored on top of it. And it was about 20 feet below us. And I remember the plan was, we actually had a plan, which is unusual. Uh, the plan was that we would assemble at the, at the anchor. And then uh, Graham would lead us around what he discovered of this big structure. And so down we went and uh, I managed to get myself immediately behind Graham in this little chain of people who are going to follow around the reef. And we started off on what looked like level ground as far as I could see in all directions. And there was various bits of coral and there were fish swimming around and it was beautifully clear and everything was fine. And I was following behind uh, Graham and his flippers were ahead of me and he went up over a slight rise and he disappeared. And that's strange. I wondered what was going on and I went up over the slight rise. And to understand this, you have to know that, that I'm afraid of heights. I have agoraphobia. And I came up over this rise and suddenly I was 90 feet above the reef and the water was crystal clear and I was terrified. And I had a, a deep, uh, took a quick breath and, and then I recovered and I said, you stupid idiot, you're diving, you can't fall. <laughs> and then, I, and then yeah. I had the most magnificent gliding dive down to the bottom again and caught up with Graham. Um, feeling I imagine the way a vulture feels as he's circling over a valley or, or an eagle or something is the most wonderful, exhilarating feeling. Uh, and then we went on the rest of the trip and it was a great balmy. It had all kinds of beautiful uh, corals and it had caves and it had big fish and little fish and everything. But I always remember that that first moment of suddenly being transported to being uh, somewhere that, oh, this is different. And, yeah. uh, and I've seen lots of places on reefs that do that to you. And it's fun. Yeah. And that that depth perspective element is is mind blowing. Exactly. Like you said, you, <laughs> you have agoraphobia, but nothing's going to happen. You're not going to fall yeah. off the cliff. 
Um, oh, you're so making me miss scuba diving. I've been diving for so long and just that sensation of just floating down yeah. towards a bomby. Oh my goodness. I miss you it. Know, I got hit by the same thing with you telling that story. That was, that was mm. perfect. That was the best. You win yeah. the prize of all of our stories. That was the best thing. That one moment. Exactly. You hit it. Bullseye. Yeah. Um, you ever, uh, either of you guys ever dive at Myrmidon Reef on the Great Barrier Reef? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I did. And, and actually that was, I made a list of, mm. uh, of things that I would use as my uh, example. And yeah. that was one of them. Oh, and God. It, it was uh, yeah. in the year 2000, the reef was still like virtually hundred percent coral cover. And there's these big spur and grooves. So there's this deep valley. And I was uh, doing something, so I was behind the group, and it really looked like my, the group in front of me were flying. You could, you had no sense that there was water there. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. That's cute. exactly. So Myrmidon is way out there on the outer edge of the outer reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, so it's really stuck out into the Coral Sea, and the visibility out there is like, you know, who knows, four or five hundred foot is just the the water is is as transparent as air. And I, there was just one cruise I was on when I was a postdoc in Ames where we stopped out there for just a day just to get in a dive at Myrmidon. And we went out there and I jumped off the Zodiac and my eyeballs about exploded when I just looked around like, God, what a panorama. Um, some of those reefs are beyond belief. Uh, OK, so we've established our joy of coral reefs and we're not going to get to the butt yet. But uh, what, what I do want to do is dive in a little bit of the science because that's the unique element here is Peter. Um, it's actually a little bit of background on this thing, a tiny bit awkward about you know, five or six or seven years ago, an editor from a publisher, uh, an academic publisher, sent me a manuscript uh, that, that Peter had written for a book. And um, I sent it back and said, this, I'm not the right guy to review this thing. Um, unbeknownst to me, he sent back my semi-rejection email. He forwarded it to Peter about his book. This was his first book before we got to the Coral Reef book. And so Peter, when he sent me a copy of this copy of this new book, felt the need to print out a stick on message here that has the quote of from my email to him. And then here's his note he sent to me. It said to Randy Olson, who said about an earlier book, quote, sale has a great book in him. This isn't it, <laughs> unquote. Maybe second time lucky, Peter Sale. <laughs> so of all the awkward, embarrassing things to have happen, uh, but thank goodness it, it is exactly right. That's what I said was that book to me wasn't the one because the old adage, write only what you know about. And I knew that Peter had an entire lifetime of, of enormous knowledge of coral reefs. And it's so important for some of these senior folks at this stage in their career to get this stuff out, to, to leave it around for people to, to get some value out of with uh, future generations. Um, I, I, there's a bunch of scientists I know that you know moved on and failed to ever really synthesize what they'd learned. So I felt like there was an urgency of that. And thank goodness um, he did exactly that. He wrote this book. It is the book on coral reefs. That is what he's got his big body of knowledge about. Um, Peter, you want to give us a few thoughts about how you moved on from the first book to this one and, and also why are you doing this? You know, lots of scientists don't ever get around and do this. What's the, the fire that made you actually do it? Well, first of all, I, I don't think I, I don't think I was attempting to summarize uh, the science. I was I was attempting to explain how it is that for a scientist, the science is an integral part of what makes the reef so fantastic. And, and trying to bring people into the mind frame of those of us who, who understand these systems. So, th so that was what I was really trying to do. Um, and uh, I decided to write the book because it gradually dawned on me that Telling people about the problems of coral reefs doesn't automatically get them excited. It doesn't get them wanting to go and do something. Um, and I vividly remember, and I put it in this book, I vividly remember a conference in Fort Lauderdale in 1999 when the thing I remember vividly from that conference is the conversations that we had during the poster sessions, you know, when all these eager people were saying, come over here, listen to my exciting story, my work is better than anyone else's. Um, but we were busy drinking and talking and 
bit of both, you know, and and mostly we were talking about the global um, bleaching event, which had occurred during the El Nino of, of 97, 98. It was the first time many of us had a chance to talk to people who'd been in the Indian Ocean or had been in the South Pacific and so on and so forth. And the conversations, the reason I remember those conversations is because not so much that we were talking about how terrible it was and how with climate change, it was only likely to get worse. What we were doing was saying, this is such a spectacular event. This is such a bizarre event, reefs turning white all the way around the world, um, that it will, it will be the trigger. It will be the the um, canary draw, falling off its cage in the mine, and people will take note, and the world will be energized, and we'll deal with climate change, and this is great. And people started talking about coral reefs as canaries, and and then of course, it slowly dawned on me as the years went by that they didn't happen. We got a lot of recognition, we got a lot of media attention, we got a lot of uh, coral reef information out there and embedded into the global information about what is happening to the world. But for the great majority of people, it was just another sad environmental story. So what? Well, okay, let me let me dive in a little bit here on communication dynamics. And <clears throat> that that anecdote that you opened the book with, I, I thought was excellent. You know, it was really powerful in the preface there, which is exactly what you said. And it's pure ABT. You know, once upon a time, there were these coral reefs, we all loved them, we had fun, yada, yada, all through the 90s. But then there was this massive worldwide global bleaching event that happened that we thought might be kind of bad. And it wasn't until we all got together at this one meeting, began matching notes that it began to come clear to us. This is this is more than just bad. This is actually world altering type of thing. And the world's never been the same since then. Uh, I, I want to encourage you, especially as you get out there and talk about this book, as you know, somebody that's written five books on communication, take that little anecdote right there and don't don't dismiss it. Don't say think of it as one of 20 different things. That's your fundamental entry point for big, broad audiences. It, it's so perfect. Um, Jeremy Jackson, who I did an awful lot of work with, who's a brilliant communicator. And 20 years ago, I teamed up with him on our Shifting Baselines project. Um, <clears throat> and he instinctively knew how to tell good stories. And he had this great anecdote that he used over and over again, which was he told the story about all of his years in Jamaica, how much he loved working on those reefs, and that he dreamed of the day when he could bring one of his kids back to go diving on those reefs to show them how beautiful it was. And he brought his daughter, Rebecca, there finally, and they took her out snorkeling that day on the reef that first day. And she raved about it. But what he was looking at was remnants of the reef that he loved over the years. And that was his little ABT. And I heard him tell that story probably six or seven different times for big public um, talks. And that's exactly how it should be. You know, you should get that one anecdote and shape it and hone it and milk it for what it's got for the big broad audience. And yeah, if you're talking to the same people over and over again, you don't want to keep repeating it. But that one stock piece is so good. And that's my feeling when I read that thing was that was better than anything I'd read in that first book that you wrote. That was the that opening anecdote. This is take a look at any good New Yorker article. It begins with that anecdote that pulls us into understanding the overall uh, story that you're telling here. And that was your perfect ABT to open with. And then, as you say, the therefore, the therefore is, are we doing something about it? And then you get deeper into that, which is, mm -hmm. is really, really great. Um, what's, what's your feeling so far on the book and how it's going and the, the feedback you're getting and things like that? I think it's still a little early. Um, mm -hmm. I've had good feedback from, from people who read it and have contacted me, uh, some of them people who are not scientists at all, and they've said they enjoyed it. Uh, they frequently said some of the science was a bit too technical for me, but I could understand what you were getting at and why you were telling us. And um, they're coming away saying they enjoyed the book. And and I, one of my friends was saying his wife was so upset that uh, she wanted him to put solar panels on the roof because of reading this book. Now, I mean, I didn't say anywhere in this book that people needed to put solar panels <laughs> on the roof. But, but if that's the effect yeah. it has on some people, I'm very happy. Yeah, I want to do something. Um, now, Bob, let's let's hear your review of the book. You just got through reading it. 
Yeah, no, I, I liked it a lot. And um, uh, I, I've heard some of these stories before, but um, I, as a science nerd, uh, I wanted to say that I actually thought uh, I really particularly liked uh, corals as a sort of a theoretical laboratory for ecology. And um, some of the uh, major contributions uh, Peter has made um, resonates with people who don't really give a darn about coral reefs. Um, he points out very well that so many universities are found in these northern latitude places which tend to have lower diversity and uh, people at Yale like G. Evelyn Hutchinson uh, like to think that uh, the way to understand an, a complex ecosystem is, is to understand uh, all the dimensions of each species so that a species will almost be like an atom and you put a couple of atoms together, you have a compound and you could reconstruct ecosystems that way. And so he was really focused on the uniqueness of species. And what Peter's work did, and he describes it nicely in the book, is uh, he showed that in fact, um, a lot of species uh, are ecologically very similar. And maybe the better way of describing what's going on is, is actually focusing more on, on the similarity among species, but, um, but the chance events, you know, whether there's a little coral head that uh, is, is virtually empty, so the baby fish can recruit there. Um, so from my perspective, uh, you know, the bigger take home message is you were focused on uh, what does this mean for climate change? And of course, that's huge. And as you probably know, just this week, the World Heritage um, folks are wondering whether the Great Barrier Reef should come off of the World Heritage Site because of the mortality of the Great Barrier Reef. And that is resonating uh, when it's dollars that are really, uh, you know, having an impact. Wait, 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 wait. Hang, hang, on, hang on, slow that down a little bit. Tell us a bit more what, what that news is. Okay, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is uh, one of the World Heritage Sites. It's uh, part of the United Nations. And uh, it actually, there are people who like to visit every World Heritage Site. It has very big uh, tourist value. Well, how how so, many are there, you think? I, I don't know in total. I mean, World Heritage Sites include like the Great Pyramids and the, it, it includes uh, a lot of on land um, historical things. Uh, I'm not sure how many are actually just biological, like the Great Barrier Reef. I, uh, I hey, hey Matt, Matt, can you try and search World Heritage Sites, even get us some rough ballpark estimate? Are there, are there 10 or are there 10,000 or something? But anyhow, keep going, Bob. Sorry. But the bottom line is that the, the, the value of that as a World Heritage Site has to do with the health and vigor of the Great Barrier Reef. And they are this week reevaluating whether in fact the degradation has gotten so severe that it should no longer be listed as a World Heritage Site. Okay, so the bottom line of all that is if they did that, that's saying to all the tourists, don't bother anymore. There's nothing to see, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, that, it, would, it would have a very, very big uh, impact, uh, frankly. Yeah, hey, let's so, see. Uh, what, what, is, what does Matt say here? Sorry to be nerds about this. Uh, UNESCO lists 1,121 monuments in 167 countries as World Heritage Sites. So there you go. I just wanted to get a ballpark estimate on how significant that was. But that's, okay, keep going. But, you know... Um, if you take a step back, and, and we mentioned this fellow, G. Evelyn Hutchinson, uh, some of his classic papers, which started in the late 1950s, were that it was some of the first time ecologists started thinking about uh, what are the bigger consequences of the loss of biodiversity. So we have to understand diversity, how many species, and why are there so many species, and how do they interact? And that was the, the initial impetus for him to get into this every species is unique idea. Um, and what Peter points out well, and he very, you know, he points out that, you know, really tropical rainforest people are really in the same category. When you deal with these highly diverse systems, um, there are better ways of abstracting to really understand what's driving that system. And uh, I just one other point that I wanted to raise, and that is when you and I were in Jamaica and we were mm -hmm. teaching the coral reef ecology course, back then the notion was highly diverse ecosystems are highly stable. And all you have to do is, is read Peter's book for, you know, leave through it for five minutes and you see these highly diverse ecosystems are really highly fragile. And, uh, and, they, and so the, the former uh, theories about stability just have to be thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. Peter may disavow everything I just said, but yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Peter, how do you defend yourself? <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll defend myself by saying that I think most people won't see that as the most important part of the book. Um, I think, 
and and uh, and nor is it necessarily wrong that Bob sees that as important. I think the uh, I think some of the work I did back in the uh, early seventies did ask important questions that. Um, needed to be asked because we were going very merrily down a path uh, where we were confirming our beliefs repeatedly and uh, we were pretty well stuck with a picture of the world which was not quite true and uh, to the extent that I and a number of other people were able to to bring up some opposing arguments I think it I think it helped our science. Um, I think, however, that my feelings about coral reefs go well beyond uh, their importance to science. I think, I think the, the, um, the thing that has bothered me consistently, and it's been something that I was trying to think about this the other day, is something that's been around uh, through much of my life, is I've always had a feeling that we need to respect the natural world. And um, yet I look around me and I see lots and lots of people who don't have that belief. Uh, lots and lots of people who think that, um, you know, as, a, as I think I said in the book, the, the environment is, is sort of the larder full of shelves of things that we can use at no cost. And it's also got some space to put stuff that we don't need anymore as garbage. And, and that's a terrible way to treat the environment. And, and, uh, but that's the way we mostly treat it. And if I can get just one or two people to start thinking that maybe there's other ways of looking at it, uh, that'd be good. And that's what I'm really trying to do here. And well, I don't know I, if it's going to work. I really don't know if it's going to yeah, work. Yeah, but the, the starting point is exactly what you say, which I think that's very, very good, is the, the realization that everybody else doesn't share your values. Yeah. And, you know, a decade ago, I was at this thing, the Aspen Environment Forum, and E.O. Wilson, they had an evening of the host interviewing him. And I was a TA for him long, long ago. Um, and so in the middle of that evening, he said, I, you know, and I think we're at the point now where we can all agree that the single biggest crisis of our generation is the loss of biodiversity. And in the Q&A, being an obnoxious man that I am, I got up there and I said, you know, if I asked all my buddies in Kansas to list the 10 biggest crises facing us today, not a one of them is going to list biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find really distressing is academics in their bubble thinking that the rest of the world shares their values and what you're addressing right there is they don't, they don't, they don't even think this value, this nature stuff's that important, valuable. So you got to use that as a starting point of unappreciating how enormous the challenge is. And that's where you get into that. And that one chapter is really, really good. And by the way, you know, that's my favorite chapter. Why don't we seem to care about coral reefs? Um, <laughs> and I love the little excerpt you've got in there from this numbnut writer who writes this article about coral reefs and starts it off by saying, once upon a time, there was a city so dazzling, kaleidoscopic, so braided in water, blah, 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 blah. That's not compelling. That's just, you know, writer gobbledygook that somebody who probably never went to a coral reef in his life and looked it up on the internet and saw a bunch of pretty pictures and said, I'm going to write a bunch of purple prose here. Um, that's where the storytelling tell, stuff is so important. The power of storytelling rests in the specifics to be able to talk in the first person about this is what's out there and this is how it had an impact on me. So I think your communications advice is really, really good in the book there. And it is an enormous challenge, but got to start somewhere with it. Um, Bob, you're, oh, here's one thing. You, you, Bob, you gave me flashbacks to the summer of my last year as an undergraduate marine ecology course I took at Duke University Marine Lab, where I learned from Peter's paper this giant 10 letter word that I had never heard before um, that starts with S. Peter, can you guess what that word was coming out of your lottery hypothesis paper? <laughs> Come on. Um, Serendipity. No, close, but the opposite of deterministic. Uh, my brain's gone. Blind. Bob, can you help us, Bob? Ten letter word, opposite of deterministic. Thing with this. Um, lottery hypothesis. What's it all about? Randomness. Big word for randomness, starting randomness with S. Randomness begins with an R. <laughs> no, no, big word starts with S. Come on, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have guessed it by now. S S T O. <laughs> 
Stone. Okay. Me, me, me. Okay. Stick. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. No, that, that's, a, that's a word that actually was very big in the literature, but it's actually fallen off uh, Peter's cliff uh, and it doesn't know how to swim. So it's well, gone it, down. Tell <laughs> us what happened to stochastic. Well, you know, it's, uh, it, it's really not exactly the same as random for one thing. And that's really important. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think what you're seeing a, light, a, a lot more on, on path dependency and, um, and uh, channelization of, of some trends. I mean, you know, there are, there's a whole bag of, of words that uh, will make a proposal seem more scientific so it will get funded. Um, but it doesn't help with communication a terribly great amount. Um, but when you were at Duke, uh, what, John Sutherland was there. That, that was the course. It was John Sutherland's course. That's who I met Jeremy through that. And that's where we read your American Naturalist Lottery Hypothesis paper. That was one of the, you know, three or four. Shit, no doubt. Well, uh, no, his Brian Zones were, were telling him pretty much the same thing. Right, Randy? Uh, yeah, he was he was really big and he was the one that was big on that word stochastic. And I'd never heard it before. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I, I'd had matrix algebra, actually, and, and worked a little bit with um, stochastic matrices and things of that sort but um but keep going what what happened to the word stochastic it went out of vogue yeah well i mean all i all i could say is uh you can go to ecology you name it the journal and you can look up keywords and uh and you'll see uh the years that it shows up and you'll <laughs> see that it that it's spiked and it went back down i, I just simply don't see it that much anymore but That's where so i fascinating. this is that john sutherland actually was observing on little settlement plates that uh, the bryozoans that that made it uh, were the first ones to arrive, which is exactly what Peter Sale was finding on coral reefs. Which yeah, yeah, uh, it gives you a, a, a lot of um, of a theory becomes more robust when entirely different systems see some of the same conclusions. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. I keep going to science, so I'm sorry about that. Well, no, no, no. But at, at the broader and simpler level, this is really, really interesting because it's about the things like the balance of nature concept. And right. there are many people out there who believe that there's these guided forces that make sure that nature all gets put together the same way, predictably, this, that, and the other thing. And it's kind of the polar opposite of that, which is, look, sometimes we can't tell you at all what's going to be out there on a coral head because it was just a bunch of random events that happened. And suddenly we got a bunch of these things, a very deep philosophical divide at some level. And, and those two approaches to how you look at nature that I'm sure people still are squabbling back and forth. Um, I spent a lot of time around evolutionists that were big into non-equilibrium theory, which is kind of right. matches up the same basic deal. And that's, that's a lot of what was going on back then. I mean, this is what distresses me is to look at the societal shifts from the interactive sixties and the hippie era and everything like that, that was all touchy feely and how ecology matched those patterns. And suddenly in the sixties at the same time, it was really popular to look at interspecific interactions. And then we got to the heartless eighties and suddenly things started to shift back to more physical processes and, and less the interact. I don't know. Sometimes it leaves you a little skeptical on some of these large scale patterns. What's at work there? Is it really everybody thinking these things through? Or are they being driven by societal attitudes? I don't know. You got any thoughts on that over the ages, Peter? Uh, I think there are, there are certainly, uh, there, there are certainly, um, what's the word I want? There are patterns in the way science changes that have very little to do with rational decision making. It, there you go, exactly. There are, cats, there are things that come and go. Um, we've gone through a period in the in the recent past, uh, the last 30 years is the recent past for me, where everything's got to be high tech. And if you can use DNA, it'll be even better than if you can't. And, you know, it's amazing what people can do with DNA. Um, it's fantastic what people can do with really sophisticated equipment, but frequently what you find is you end up with, you've managed to amass this equipment and these techniques, and you become so embedded in continuing to use them because yeah. they're still sitting there on the shelf that you don't ask the questions anymore. You, you find things that you've got an answer for. And, and I, I think that uh, we sometimes, there's a beautiful thing in Carl List today. I don't know how many of you follow Carl List, but Gene Shin, bless his heart, uh, put a post up. There have been a lot of people talking about coral fragmentation as a way of 
uh, replicating coral for for recolonization purposes and and Gene just told a couple of stories of work he was doing back in the 60s that was totally unplanned it was totally unfunded and um, but it got some results in terms of where coral would grow and where coral wouldn't grow and whether a small piece of coral would grow better than a big piece of coral and so on and so forth and he finished his post with saying something along the lines that uh, this work was pretty trivial and there's no way it would even get considered by a funding agency mm -hmm. um, and um, but that's okay it answered the question and you know it answered a question in 1966 that people are still ignoring has been answered yeah. in 2021 <laughs> and they're still breaking up coral and planting them out and claiming they're saving the world. Now, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we're, so, we're so tied up in our technology and we're so tied up in the present, we can't look back to the past and see that maybe some of these things have actually been answered already. You know, and, and maybe there's work that was answered superficially and could be brought forward and done something with. Well, this, okay, this, this now starts to really get into communication dynamics because um, what you're talking about there is context. And this is in our journey with the ABT and especially the last year and a half where it's been very intense. We've been doing this course and, and week after week after week, we've, we're starting our 15th and 16th rounds in August. And in the beginning, we thought the important thing was the button, the therefore, and the end stuff at the beginning is just, you know, you want to keep that to a minimum. Let's get the story started. Let's get to the butt. Well, with time, we've come to respect and learn that the whole magic is in that opening thing, the end. That's the context. That's how you put things into their big picture. And if you don't pay attention to how you're setting problems, you're on a treadmill. You're just doing all this shallow stuff over and over again. You know, but here's the problem here. Here's the problem here. That's what social media is. It doesn't have long enough. And Twitter doesn't give you enough space there to put anything into context. So you've got all these people on all their little treadmills running as fast as they can about this, this, and this. Um, Julie Clausen just said, Genu oh, okay, genuflect to the elders is a catchphrase out of our course from Diana Padilla, who teaches a section on proposal writing. And that's her little catchphrase that is really wonderful, which is, you know, you have to absorb the importance of you've got to genuflect to the elders. You have to understand there is all this knowledge that comes before you. And if you don't put things into context, you're just never going to build this whole big mountain of knowledge that you're hoping to do. And that is exactly what it runs into nowadays. And that's why some of these senior figures, you know, get shoved aside. And in fact, they are the real wellspring of knowledge because they've got that ability to put things into context and ask these questions. That's what I always got with Bob Payne in the years that I spent out there walking around the intertidal, that guy's ability to just glance around and see one species that's out of place. And because of the depth of his intuition and knowledge, mm -hmm. he can instantly ask that one question because mm -hmm. he had the giant context to put it all in the big picture. And the younger ecologists couldn't do that. I didn't, you know, I sat there like, oh my God, that's an interesting question. I never would have thought of that. Um, that again is why your book is so important. It's this body of knowledge that's accumulated over time. Um, Bob, you and I were talking about it. So at, at the delicate risk of offending our clientele in the ABT framework course, uh, our favorite partner group is the National Park Service and a lot of their scientists and lots of them, everybody works on their own individual ABT, the narrative of their project they're doing. And a lot of those are about eDNA, environmental DNA, mm -hmm. this idea of going out and taking samples and just looking at all the DNA in that sample. And it's incredible. I'm sure it tells you volumes and volumes, but who's out there looking at these fish bumping into each other on the coral reef day in, day out. I don't know how you substitute for that. Maybe enough video cameras out there or something. I, um, Bob, your thought on that first, then we'll let Peter talk in the bigger part yeah, of that. I, I think that's very relevant to um, the, the issue of context because uh, we have a very big eDNA e project going on in Maine. And um, what I'm hearing from people is that they can tell you presence or absence of some species that are there that you can say virtually nothing about their abundance. And going a step further, um, when we try to hire somebody in the School of Marine Sciences, I keep lobbying to have somebody who can at least recognize whole organisms. I mean, we actually have, you know, they just dive right into the genome and there's just no capacity to understand the bigger picture about how organisms interact. You can't get that out of DNA. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think okay. I think it really speaks to also what we were saying earlier about people caring. I mean, it's harder to care just about data than it is to care about organisms in their environments. Mm. So I, I didn't end up staying in marine biology. I became a, a, a mammal ecologist, a mammal behavioural ecologist. But my PhD was spent trekking around in a forest night after night, year after year, following around this particular species of possum. And people used to laugh at me because we were just on the edge there of the satellite technology coming out and Maybe possibly I could have done some satellite tracking rather than radio tracking of being out there on foot. But I didn't want to do satellite tracking. I wanted to see my animals and see how they were behaving and see what they were doing every night. And I just don't know that I ever would have cared so much and loved that forest and those animals that occupied that forest nearly as much if I'd just been looking at a computer screen and following little, you know, tracking movements. I wanted to be out there. And it's exactly what you're talking about. Well, and you know, that grades right into the fishermen that Bob has plenty of knowledge with there on the coast of Maine. And, you know, some of those folks have no science background, but man, do they have the hours out there? And Bob, a couple of thoughts on the value of fishermen? Oh, you bet. I mean, you know, they're out there all the time. And, uh, and the, 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 you know, I, one time I was doing this uh, project and I was tr trying to drop my quadrat and there was a lobster uh, trap in this little crevice and it's no bigger than the desk that I'm sitting at now. And I picked up the trap, I moved it aside. And the next day, the lobster was sitting at that spot waiting for me to come back. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, "He said you move my trap. I said, <laughs> I, I, said I, I didn't move it more than six feet. He says, I know. I put it in that slot every day. Every day I catch a lobster. Yesterday, I didn't catch my lobster. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, Peter, have, have you gotten to know some fishermen over the years? I've, I've talked to fishermen, yes. It's, uh, it's interesting that sometimes they know a lot and you get really impressed. I've recently been involved with, with some uh, people here. The, the province is, is readjusting the uh, recreational fishing regulations. And so they've got a committee of people who are mainly fishermen who are sort of a sounding board. And I've had to travel with these people back and forth to the meetings in a car. And I listen to them talking and they're so wrapped up in fishing and they go on and on and on. Some of them know an incredible amount. It is really impressive. On the other hand, I also ran into a situation, this was in Jamaica, um, and this is second hand. It was a social scientist telling me his, he was tearing his hair out. He was trying to work with the trap fishermen. The trap fishermen understood that the baby fish come from the ocean. They understood that perfectly. They knew the importance of having places for the baby fish to live. But they saw no problem with taking all the adult fish because the baby fish will come from the ocean. And the idea that maybe there need to be some adult fish to produce the baby fish to go out <laughs> to the ocean, that was never there. That's so so you've got to be a little bit careful with, with the with the brilliance of, of fishermen, but but yeah, yeah. Um, they, everybody's got their own contributions to make. Um Julie Claus plenty, plenty of people other than scientists who know about the natural world and yes. can tell you some very impressive things about it. Exactly, and, uh, which is why it's don't so pay enough attention. Yeah, why it's so important for scientists scientists to be a little bit broader in their thinking and listening. Um, Julie Clausen, you want to join us here? And two things. Number one, did you have a coral reef story to share with us? I, I do. Um, and mine comes from Belize as well. It was my very first project. And you know that saying, you never forget your first time. Well, I think for everyone that jumps into uh, it, over a coral reef their first time, you just don't forget it. And uh, this was in the mid 80s, it was in the Belize. We had a project working on conch on the barrier reef. And, uh, you know, the clarity of the water was just, you know, as Peter says, it's just, uh, it's just, you just can't believe how clear it is. And you're, you, you're, you're seeing 150 feet down and, you know, it looks like it's right there. But uh, it, was a, it was a big moment for me. I was snorkeling along my first time and I look over and there's this eye right next to me and this huge tarpon. And I, you know, of course, you know, sputtered and jumped and, uh, you know, was frightened. And then uh, five minutes later, I feel something brush along my hand and a huge moray eel was swimming right next to me and it brushed on my hand. And I, it was just this moment where I said, 
I have a choice to make. I can relax and just absorb and enjoy, or I can make this whole experience just, I can be frightened and scared the whole time. And I just remember that distinctly because there were big things out there that were scaring me and I just had to, you know, just had to accept it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's, you just made me think of one more story. I will contribute towards the end, but uh, did you have one good question for Peter uh, from his blogs? You read uh, a few of the blog posts that he had there. Yeah, I, well, I I think this the the question that I really am curious about is why don't we care about coral reefs? I mean, the coral reefs is interesting because you have an industry that's built around it. You have um, you have uh, you know the dive industry, you have the aquarium industry, you have the fishing industry. So you have these you know these non science groups that really should care about their health. And so then why is it? you know, not other ecosystems. I work on, you know, um, I've worked on mangroves and flats. You know, we don't have that audience. Well, I would think the dive community itself would be such a huge proponent of, of pushing for conservation. You know, what's, what's the disconnect there? Or is there a disconnect and they're just not loud enough? Part, part of the disconnect is the lack of understanding. Um, there are lots and lots of, there, there are divers who, have really taken the time to learn about what they're seeing. And they have immense knowledge, frequently knowledge that the scientists don't have. But there are also a lot of a lot of divers, probably the majority, who a pretty place is a pretty place. And it can be a pretty dead place or a pretty living place. And it's still a pretty place. And so the, the thing that makes the coral reef so fantastic from my point of view is, is irrelevant to them. And, and, and this is surprising, but that's, I think, the only explanation. Um, and uh, so we have a, a situation where people who, who could be real, really in the vanguard of pushing for, for concern about coral reefs, who, who are still happily diving on things that are a pale reflection of what they used to be. And, yeah, and you know, that's... Yeah. Well, that's that's the whole problem of shifting baselines. Exactly. exactly. People don't quite know what they've lost there uh, precisely. And that's that's probably a good note for us to be wrapping up on. Uh, we could go on for a few hours on this. This has been awesome. And Bob, you were a great addition to to add into this whole mix. Um, and let's see, Jen had to take off. She's got a course that she has to teach. So she wanted she raved about it. this has been one of the best episodes ever. Um, you just Julie, you made me think of one last stupid story that I have to share that I haven't thought about this since it happened a billion years ago. But at Lizard Island, I was out there on that little patch reef in front of the tent that I slept in for a year, um, six to eight hours a day out there following larvae sitting there about six to eight foot deep on the, the little patch reef uh, all day long staring at these little larvae coming out. And it was, you know, the water's chilly there. So you wear a wetsuit all day long. And all of a sudden one day, something just started grabbing my crotch <laughs> and I'm kneeling on the sand flat. And like somebody, I thought it was one of my friends came up from behind me, just grabbed me right there. And I spin around and it was a remora trying to attach itself to me right there. <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but it just scared the hell out of me. Like, get away from me, you remora, you. Sorry. Okay, there's a story <laughs> to wrap it all up with that I haven't even thought of for 30 years. Um, on that note, Peter, have you got any, well, let's see, Bob, you got a final statement for us about the wonderful book and um, all the people that need to, to read it. Uh, yeah, Bob no, first. it's good. It, it's, uh, it, it covers a terrific breadth and uh, brings everybody to the Anthropocene, which is uh, where we are today. And what are we going to do about it? Isn't that the truth? And on that note, Peter, have you got some advice to everybody on what to do about it, starting with getting your wonderful book? I've got, I've got, uh... No advice, except I wish people would read it because that's why I wrote it. Uh, and um, I think um, if people enjoy it, I'd love to hear from them or I'd love to hear hear them tell their friends because getting a book visible is really, really difficult these days. And uh, so that's my plea. Um, I think there's some stories in there that can entertain most people and uh, uh, if uh, if someone reads it and thinks it's good, tell a friend or two or three. And well, and of course, I will say, actually, all the listeners, um, do Peter a favor and write a, re a great review on his Amazon page. That ends up being very important with these books, unfortunately, in this strange world that we've got today. Uh, one overarching thing I will say is that I think back 
40 years ago, and there were only a, sp a few sp spokespersons out there for science and, and nature. And Jacques Cousteau was the guy that we grew up with, um, who, you know, great guy, the best of intentions, but really not the science. He wasn't a scientist. So you always have to kind of set the public straight on that. You know, he wasn't a marine biologist. He was just a popularizer, great guy. Uh, over the years, I met so many marine biologists that I felt were really smart and, and really good communicators. A lot of them. That's a lot of what drove me into what I do nowadays is not only to learn this stuff, but to go back, especially with people like Jeremy Jackson. Who I've spent, you know, a lot of a bunch of years there working with him, trying to help some of these folks communicate more effectively because I'd like to live in a society where the spokespeople for these causes are the people that actually have the knowledge as opposed to the people who've got the most Twitter followers, which unfortunately is what we kind of evolved into. But on that note, um, you're one of the people that needs to be a lead spokesperson for coral reefs in general, and it's such a huge issue. So I hope that uh, this book will get some traction like that and people understand you've got the the, the powerful perspective on it that is needed to help preserve coral reefs for the long haul. So on that note, thank you very, very much. The book is Coral Reefs from Yale University Press. And Bob, we're going to have you back eventually as the lead guest. Uh, but you were a great wingman for today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Julie, for thoughts on Peter's blog. And everybody have a great weekend. And we'll see you next week on the ABT Time podcast. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. See ya.